So a short introduction to this program. Uh, so why are we looking at the role of neuroimaging again for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, that's because we, we think we're preparing for a new era uh, with the uh, imminent uh, introduction of disease-modifying therapies. Um, these are my disclosures. I work with very firm, various pharmaceutical companies, um, not just in the Alzheimer's space, but also in the multiple sclerosis space. But I won't mention any drug labels. Uh, and uh, I should mention that I was the coordinator of the Amipad consortium, which you see here at their final consortium meeting, uh, where we studied the role of amyloid PET, uh, both for diagnostic and prognostic uh, purposes. You'll hear a little bit more about that from Alex in his talk. So I'm sure you, when you follow the news or even when you don't follow the news, you've seen that uh, the term Alzheimer's appears a lot in uh, recent times. Um, and that has to do with the development of treatments, uh, which has been uh, an uphill battle for, for decades, I would say, with many, many drugs failing. But more recently, there have been positive uh, results from, from trials, especially those using uh, anti-amyloid antibodies. To the extent that two antibodies have now been approved by the FDA. The first one was aducanumab. Uh, that came with a lot of debate because one of the phase three trials was positive clinically, the other one was uh, negative or at least dubious. Uh, so that sparked a lot of debate. Uh, but then the second one, lecanumab, got approved with very positive, convincing results also on clinical endpoints. And then uh, more recently, we heard the results of the Denanumab study, which was uh, also positive, but they haven't yet um, uh, filed for, app for uh, approval yet. And it's uh, good to realize that only Lecanumab has uh, submitted the dossier for approval in Europe at the EMA. And uh, we expect to hear from that uh, somewhere early next year. Also good to realize that it's not just amyloid that's being targeted, also drugs against uh, tau are being developed uh, against antibodies. And uh, for example, at ADPD and AIC, we've heard some very uh, interesting um, results from very early stage tau removal, where tau indeed is being removed, uh, which is exciting. And we'll follow this closely, of course. And then beyond that, other disease modifying pathways are being targeted again with antibodies, for example, against TREM. So multiple molecular pathways are being targeted in the, in the Alzheimer's space with, with increasing uh, success, especially for the amyloid therapies at the moment. And uh, for that, it is really important that we move from the old fashioned approach of a syndromic to a more etiologic diagnosis. Uh, and by syndromic, I mean people having mild cognitive impairment, which most people think is a prelude of, of Alzheimer's disease, but often, often it is. And dementia, which we try to classify as, uh, as Alzheimer's dementia, for example, or frontotemporal dementia. Uh, but to, to be able to do so, we need biomarker information uh, because we know, for example, even in my center, which we consider ourselves experts, if we think clinically that the patient has Alzheimer's disease, it turns out that we're wrong in about 20% of the cases at autopsy or based on PET findings. So there's a need to go to more ideological diagnosis, especially now that we have treatments available that target very specific uh, molecules. For example, amyloid is relevant for Alzheimer's disease, but not at all for frontal temporal dementia. And uh, therefore it's increasingly important to come to a correct etiological diagnosis. Um, here's a little overview to show you what amyloid does in, in Alzheimer's disease. Amyloid is, is a normal protein in the brain with an unknown function, but um, if, if you develop the disease, this starts to aggregate, forms oligomers, which then already start interfering with synaptic functioning. And then you get bigger extracellular plaques, which lead to uh, neurodegeneration and probably also secondarily induces the tau within the neurons, which then further contributes to neurodegeneration. And here we see the tau tangle stained in the entorhinal cortex, uh, spreading into the hippocampus, probably the stage when people develop uh, Alzheimer's disease or MCI, I should say. And then in late stages at autopsy, you can see massive volume loss of the hippocampus, which is what we recognize on MR. Um, but that is, of course, the shadow of the disease. When we see this, this is far too late and, and, uh, the, and the disease process won't be reversible anymore. If we want to see the amyloid early on, we need to use a, a PET ligand. Uh, 
such as done here, and the amyloid uh, traces have only uh, some mild off-target binding in the white matter, but they won't stay in the cortex at all. Whereas in patients with Alzheimer's disease, you can easily see that there's massive uptake throughout the whole uh, cortex. And, and in fact, as I said, moving towards an etiological diagnosis, people have developed what is called the ATN framework, where A stands for amyloid, T for tau, and N for neurodegeneration. And, and people can have various levels of combination of these uh, pathologies, and they can or cannot have cognitive impairment. So some people will only have amyloid, uh, in which case we speak of Alzheimer's pathological change, or they can have Alzheimer's all, uh, amyloid pathology and tau pathology, in which case we speak about Alzheimer's disease. And if you then, in addition, have cognitive decline and, and dementia, you have Alzheimer's dementia. So there's Alzheimer pathology, Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's dementia. And we have to be careful how we use these terms. And then there are also people who have strange other combinations, which I'll touch upon briefly. So how can we operationalize this? Well, we can either look at uh, metabolites in CSF, where you can measure amyloid and tau, or we can use imaging markers. And here's an example from Cliff Jack's uh, seminal paper uh, about the ATM framework where we see on the left-hand side a patient with Alzheimer's disease with a positive amyloid scan, then a tau scan, which is positive in the typical temporal parietal areas. We'll hear about that later. And the patient also have has neurodegeneration uh, as evidenced by MRI with loss of hippocampal volume, but also more generalized atrophy. Then there are people who have preclinical Alzheimer's pathology. So just an amyloid scan that is positive, but no tau abnormality and no neurodegeneration. These are probably very early on and probably at risk to develop Alzheimer's at some stage in the coming years, if not get decades. But then there's also people who have neurodegeneration without tau, but they do have amyloid. And uh, this is probably neurodegeneration due to some other mechanism, because we all think that you have to first have amyloid, which then will produce tau and then neurodegeneration. So these people have so-called suspected non-Alzheimer pathology in addition to Alzheimer's pathology, so I have a combination. And that is often is obviously something that happens a lot in, in medicine, that people uh, having one disease are not uh, safeguarded from having another disease. So if you look at amyloid accumulation in what we call preclinical stages, so that is before people even report to the doctor with, for example, mild cognitive impairment, uh, you can see that there's a build of, of amyloid occurring uh, with age. Uh, which happens later than in patients with MCI, but it does happen. And, and most likely these people at some stage will develop MCI and subsequently AD. And we know that, for example, from people with uh, familial AD, so this is a very small fraction of, of patients, 1% to 2% who have a genetic mutation. And we know roughly uh, from the age of onset of their parents when they're going to likely to have the onset of symptoms. And if you study them, Many years before onset, you will see that there are probably up to 20 years before the disease onset, there are measurable changes in, for example, CSF amyloid, but also in, in tau uh, amyloid. And, uh, and then the CSF tau comes a little bit later. Uh, glucose metabolism goes down a little bit later. Hippocampal atrophy occurs. So these are markers that are a bit closer to the disease onset, uh, but there's a long lag time before uh, people develop symptoms. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's very important that we try to target the right patients with these new drugs. Um, so the, the first studies that tried these amyloid antibodies didn't have any verification of amyloid. Um, and uh, they, they were negative, these trials, partly because they included a lot of people who subsequently were found to have negative amyloid PET scans. So that's not a good population. So all trials today have a centric criterion uh, proof of, of amyloid pathology, usually uh, at, uh, on, on a PET scan. But then uh, some also say, well, you shouldn't have too much tau uh, and, and then restrict the amount of tau that is visible on PET scans again. Uh, and in this particular uh, trial with donanumab, there was a, a treatment effect which benefited uh, patients on, on a combined clinical scale. Uh, and it was actually uh, slightly stronger in people with low to medium tau than in people with more uh, advanced uh, tau pathology. So that's probably where the field is moving, that you not only require people to be amyloid positive, but also uh, 
zoom in on a certain band of tau morphology where people are uh, where you, on, on the one hand you're you 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 think that they're likely to to be at risk on the other hand they don't have too much tau um, to the extent that they won't be amenable to treatment anymore is there still a role of MRI in the molecular area? I think there is. Um, first of all, to rule out surgical pathology, uh, to characterize the vascular burden, which may be a separate target for treatment or, or maybe uh, something that would accelerate uh, a disease process. Look at markers of neurodegeneration. Uh, with molecular imaging, we cannot characterize all types of uh, neurodegeneration. So sometimes there is a good indication uh, to have also select patients for molecular imaging. Uh, for example, patients with end-stage uh, atrophy, you may have a different picture, or people with a lot of frontal temporal uh, atrophy, you may pick a different tracer. Uh, and obviously also for safety monitoring, because the new drugs, the amyloid-lowering drugs, but even the tau and the TREM antibodies produce side effects in the, in the form of amyloid-relating imaging abnormalities that you can see on, on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, something that has to do with the amyloid removal, which is accelerated to the extent that the brain cannot cope with it anymore. 